All right. Join me in a word of prayer. Father, we are grateful for your hand in our lives, and sometimes uh, you're working in ways we, we don't even know. Somewhere down the road, we say, God was working. His hand is there. We see your provision in our lives, and we just thank you so much that you know the beginning from the end. You know what we need before we even ask for it, and you're constantly working in the lives of your children to bring us to the place where you want us to be. And we just thank you for uh, your wisdom and for your insight and for your hand in our lives. We thank you that we can come to you today uh, in this place and worship you. And we thank you for what you have for us today in your word. And, and we give this time to you, Lord, and we ask you to prepare our hearts to receive what you would have, that your Holy Spirit would be the one speaking here this morning and in charge. And I surrender myself to you and, and just say, Lord, teach us from your truth. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen. So, have you been watching the Olympics? Yeah? How many? Come on. You've been watching some of the Olympics? At least some of it? Okay. You know the current medal count? Fifth place is held by Japan. Seven golds. 24 total medals. Fourth place is Germany. Eight golds. 16 total medals. Uh, Great Britain is uh, 10 goals, 30 total medals. China is 13 goals, 41 medals. And guess who's in first? <laughs> the United States has 24 goals with a total of 60 medals. It's pretty incredible. I mean, you know, when I, when I watch the Olympics, I just, I'm amazed at the these athletes and what they can accomplish. I mean, it, it, it's, just, it's just amazing. Some of you are athletes here, you know, and you pour yourself maybe in, into what you're doing, but, but it's just incredible what the human body can do. And uh, you, know, you, you watch these, and of course, we want to watch the swimming because we've been winning all these medals in swimming. And, you know, I look at Michael Phelps, and what an incredible human being. I mean, as far as an athlete goes. I mean, this guy has won, I think, what is it, 23 gold medals now? And... Um, 28 total medals. But you know that his very first Olympics, he won no medals. He won nothing. And he said he came back from that, from that uh, Olympics and determined he was going to win another medal. And so when he won his first one, he said, I wanted more. And so he won more and he won more and he won more. But the story, I don't know if you heard about the story between uh, 2012 Olympics and this year's Olympics was that he went through a great, a long period of depression and discouragement. He thought he was out of the sport of swimming, and that just began to, you know, he started drinking, he got some DUIs, he got in a lot of trouble, and he went through a deep, dark time of depression. But eventually he rebounded, he came back, decided he wanted to be in the Olympics again, and there he is again, winning all these medals. And it's, it's an incredible thing that we can accomplish as human beings. But what's going to happen when swimming is no longer a part of his life? You know, is he going, what's he going to focus on? I know he's supposed to be getting married now and he's got a child and all these things. But you know, when we put our focus on the things of this world, uh, sooner or later those things are going, they're going to go by the wayside. You know, sooner or later we're not going to be maybe as healthy as we once were. Sooner or later some of these things will pass away. And when our hope is in the things of this world, it can lead to a great deal of discouragement and depression. We're looking in the book of Haggai. We're wrapping up the book of Haggai. Some of you haven't been with us, but we, this is our fifth week. Haggai is a little book at the, close to the end of the Old Testament. If you find Matthew, it's three little books before that. It's only two chapters. You'll miss it if you don't know where it is. But you can turn to the book of Haggai. And we've been learning some lessons here because Haggai was sent as a prophet to the post-exilic Jews to encourage them to continue building the temple. Okay? Uh, we took some time and laid down the history. You can go back and see some of these other messages if you want to. But the nation of Israel had come out of captivity. They had begun building the temple. And then they stopped. And for 14 years, the temple laid there with nothing but the foundation. And so God sends Haggai and also the prophet Zechariah to the nation of Israel to tell them to get off their seat and on their feet. 
so to speak. It's time for you to start or re, you know, continue building the temple of God. And we've made, the, we've made the connection between the Old Testament and the New Testament that we no longer worship at a temple. The building is not the main structure, the main part of a church. It's the people. And the Scriptures clearly tells us that we, the followers of Christ, are the temple of God. And it's time for us to rebuild the temple. And this is the message we've been looking at. We've been looking at what Haggai has said. There's been four specific messages that have come directly to Haggai to the people. And we're wrapping, wrapping the book up here, seeing what God is saying. We, we, we're going to go back and review some of this in a moment. But we're, gonna, we're right at the end of the book. And so if you have your, your Bibles open to Haggai chapter 2, just the last few verses here. Haggai chapter 2, verse 20. The word of the Lord came to Haggai a second time on the 24th day of the month. Now, in the beginning of chapter 2, the word of the Lord came to Haggai on the 24th day. Well, now this is a second time on the same day. The word of the Lord comes to Haggai and he speaks the word of God. Tell Zerubbabel. Now, remember Zerubbabel. Zerubbabel was the leader that, that led the people from captivity back to the land. He led 50,000 Jews back to to the land of Israel. And he's their leader. And he's, he's been assigned as the governor of Judah. Tell, tell Zerubbabel, the governor of Judah, that I will shake the heavens and the earth. I will overturn royal thrones and shatter the power of foreign kingdoms. I will overthrow chariots and their drivers, horses and their riders. I will... Uh, the horses and riders will fall each by the sword of his brother. On that day, declares the Lord Almighty, I will make you my, my servant, Zerubbabel, son of Sheatil, declares the Lord. I will make you my signet ring, for I have chosen you, declares the Lord Almighty. So previously, uh, the word of the Lord has come to, to Haggai, and he's talked about how God is going to overthrow nations one day. And now this, this is a preview of, of some time in the future that God says, look, you know, you're supposed to build this temple. Don't be afraid of these people that are over, uh, over you. They were still under the rule of, of the Persians. And they were, those were the ones still in charge. And he's basically encouraging them because this, this was part of the problem why they had stopped building the temple is because they kept getting opposition. And God is basically saying, look, I'm in charge here. I'm sovereign here. Don't you know that one day I'm going to overthrow all kingdoms, all powers, all thrones, all leaders? We've talked about in the past, in the previous message, how there's been kingdoms that rise and kingdoms that fall. Leaders that come to power and leaders that fall. All throughout history, there's a history of people and nations coming to power and eventually falling. There's none that has lasted forever. They, can, they rise and they fall. And so he's, he's encouraging them here. He says, one day I'm going to put it into all governments and I'm going to choose you, Zerubbabel, to be my leader, to be my signet ring. Now Zerubbabel here stands as a picture of Messiah. Yes, he has chosen Zerubbabel specifically as the leader, as his signet ring. The signet ring was the ring that a king would use. You know, he would use to, like, they would to put his seal of approval on something when they would put a piece of wax and he would take his ring and put his seal of approval and that was the, the king's seal of approval. That's what a signet ring was. He said, I'm making you my leader here. You're Zerubbabel. You're the one that's going to be in charge of my people. But it's also a picture of that one who would eventually come. Throughout the Old Testament, there's these pictures or these types of Christ, of Messiah, who would come and, and rule and reign. And so he's saying, Zerubbabel, I've chosen you. But in this picture of the one who will rule and reign is, is a picture of Messiah. He's a representative that Messiah would come and rule and reign. God is saying here basically, I'm, I'm in charge of all things. Don't be discouraged when you see nations come to power. Don't be discouraged because you're still under the rule of some foreign king. Don't you know that I, 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 I'm in control here? There's no kingdom that's going to last forever. I, I know everything. You see, right now, 
And some of you, you know that, that uh, recently Facebook has been hacked and all this information, got all these different things get hacked and information gets out. The Democratic Party and emails have been hacked and all this information gets out. And, and you know, we think that sometimes that everything is private, but then something gets hacked and the message gets out there. You know, what, what would happen if your email got hacked or your accounts got hacked? What would we find out? I don't know. But the thing, see, the thing is, you might be able to keep it hidden, but God's already hacked your email. He's already hacked your internet use. He's already hacked what you watch on TV. He even knows what you think. God said, look, I'm in charge of everything. Don't worry about all these people out there. I'm in charge. And I have a plan and I have a purpose for this world. You just need to be faithful to what I've called you to do. Don't be afraid of the nations. You know, we, we put a lot of hope right now in this coming election, or some of you do, that, that some people are talking about we're going to rebuild America. We've talked about that. Make America strong again. And maybe that will happen. But you know, I, I'm, not a, I'm not a prophet. I'm not here talking about end times necessarily, but, but America's not going to be around forever. America will fall one day. I'm not talking end time prophet. One, America is not going to last forever. When, when, when Jesus Christ returns again, he's not going to come back and say, oh, wow, you wonderful Americans, we'll put you in charge of everything. It's not biblical. You won't find it there. It's not there. America will not last forever. Democracy is not God's ordained form of government. We think democracy, everybody in the world should have democracy. Well, uh, look what democracy has brought us for uh, our presidential candidates. Yeah. Ugh. Great choices there. I mean, uh, democracy will fail because sinful human beings are behind it. And every nation and every government and every kingdom will one day fail because human people, human, sinful human people are behind it. God is in control. And I'll tell you this, if we continue to progress toward uh, more and more toward individual rights rather than the rights of what's good for everybody, can you progress toward this more and more? Everybody has their own right for everything. If we continue to emphasize more and more that our feelings are the basis of truth, whatever I feel today, that happens to be true. And then if we continue to reject God and His right to rule, the nation, America will fall sooner than later. And this is kind of where we are as a nation. We are not following Jesus' right to rule. We're always looking for something else, something better, and something greater. You know, there's this, uh, this new telescope array. It's called the Allen Telescope Array. And it's a very powerful array. Maybe you've heard of it. And it's put up by an organization called the Search for Extraterrestrial Intelligence Institute. Actually, this has been around for quite a while. And there's this, this array of telescopes that are looking out into space and are, are listening to trying and looking to see if we can find extraterrestrials out there. There's this hope that one day we're going to find, you know, these people on other planets, these beings out there, and, and we hope to, you know, make contact with them. First contact, right? So there's this hope that, that we're going to find some information from out of space. And I don't know if we will or not. I don't know what all is out there. But the search for extraterrestrials, you know, is, I think is a false hope. There is something out there. There is someone out there that we're failing to see. He's made himself very plain. <laughs> it's the God of the universe. We don't have to look through some telescope to find him. He's revealed himself to us very clearly in his word. And as long as we as a church continue to focus on the same things our nation is focusing on, the church will fail. 
It's not God, that's not Jesus' intention for his church. But if we keep focusing on the individual rights rather than the body, if we continue to focus on our feelings as the basis of truth rather than the word, and if we continue to, to focus on resisting Jesus' right to rule, the church will fail. Jesus has established himself as the head of his church. He is the King of kings and he is the Lord of lords. And he has called us to submit to him. Churches cannot continue to exist while resisting Jesus' right to rule. We cannot continue to exist as the church where we resist Jesus' right to rule. It may come as no surprise to you that in a recent study uh, reports that self-regard and self-promotion and just plain out bragging are becoming more and more prominent in our culture. And it's reflected in much of the pop music. The author of this study notes that in 1990, blatant bragging was basically confined to rap music. The study analyzed the, the lyrics of over 100 uh, top songs of the year from 1990, 2000, and 2010. And this is what they have to say. Compared to the earlier years, songs in 2010 were more likely to include the singer referring to the, uh, the self by name, to general self-promotion, and to bragging about wealth, a partner's appearance, or sexual prowess. A, sim a similar a non-significant increase was also seen for bragging about musical prowess and demands for respect. Uh, our culture continues to focus more and more on self and who we are and how great we are. And it's, it's reflected in our culture, it's reflected in our music. More and more we're progressing that way and more and more the church is focusing that way too. We're becoming a product of our culture. And we have to remember the church is not about us. Jesus is the head, and he's created his body to be a body, a group of people who work together, who serve one another, and who serve their community. But as long as we continue to focus on our own personal rights and what we want, the church of Jesus Christ becomes ineffective. So in this little book of Haggai, there are three, three things that are clearly evident that the Jewish people were doing to resist God's right to rule. We've talked about these a little bit. We're going to go back over and review. There's three things specifically they had, they had resisted God's right to rule. And we want to look at that and how that applies to us today and how we can avoid being the same way. If you look back in chapter 1, remember this verse, the word of the Lord comes to Haggai, and in verse 2, it says, This is what the Lord Almighty says. Remember, the Lord Almighty, or the Lord of hosts, is the God of the angel armies. That's what the Lord of hosts refers to. This is what the Lord Almighty says. These people say, The time has not yet come for the Lord's house to be built. Remember, the people were saying, You know, it's, it's just not a good time yet. Uh, it, it's not really this a good time to build the temple, and, and we're going to wait till the time is right. And we got all these other things that we need to do, and and it, you know it, it's it's just not it's not a good time right now. And, and we're we're pretty sure that God doesn't want us to build this temple yet, so we're going to wait till the time is right. And God goes on to say, verse three. Then the word of the Lord came through to the prophet Haggai. Is it a time for you yourselves to be living in paneled houses while this house remains in ruins? Remember we said paneled houses was maybe similar to what paneled houses are today. They're finished on the inside. Nice, beautiful wood. We don't use paneling much anymore. But, but basically it, it was a sign of luxury. He said, is it right for you to live in luxury when my house lays in ruins? So he began to challenge the people here. And the first thing we see is that their opinions had become truth. Their opinions had become truth. You see, they had reasoned in their own minds it wasn't a good time to build the temple. 
And, you know, all this opposition and all these people who don't really like us and, and you know, it, it, it just can't be the right time. It's not time yet to build God's temple. And, and we know because you know, we, we figured this thing out. It was their opinion that it wasn't the right time. And God is saying, really? <laughs> you figured this out? It's your opinion that it's not the right time? Hold on. <laughs> you see, we all have opinions, right? Everybody here has opinions. And, and we think that all of our opinions are correct. And we think they're truth. Uh, we, we wouldn't hold them if we didn't think that, right? I mean, you wouldn't have an opinion if you didn't think it was truth. Right? But opinions are formed from our experiences, maybe what we've been taught, from what we read, from what we listen to. We formulate these opinions. And sometimes maybe they're good opinions. But opinions are opinions. They aren't truth. The Word of God is truth. The Word of God is truth. You see, we can just be, as easy, be just like the people of Israel when we draw our opinions about what needs to happen or what, need, what we need to do or how the church needs to function or what we don't need to do because of some experience in life. And it's like, okay, what, what is God really saying? What is the Word of God saying to us? So, what we need to do is, is to realize we need to be open to allow our opinions to be challenged. To listen to different people and different things. Now recently, we've seen the, 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 you know, the De Republican National Convention and the Democratic National Convention, right? How many of you watched some of that? A few of you did? Okay, all right, good. All right. I didn't watch all of it, but during the Republican National Convention, I decided, okay, I, I, need, to, I need to listen to some of this, so I listened to Donald Trump's speech. I did. Listen to it. And uh, I'm not going to ask your opinion about Donald Trump. I'm not necessarily going to give you mine, but I just listened to his speech. And I thought, okay, um, now to be fair, next week I need to listen to the other side, right? I need to listen to Hillary's speech. I have a confession to make. I didn't listen to Hillary's speech. <laughs> Because I would already made up my mind. I already made up my opinion. And that's, that was right. I need to be open. I need to say, okay, wh wh what really is going on here? I need to look at both sides. But no, I'd already made up my mind. I, I didn't want to listen to it. Well, that's the way we are sometimes about the way we see things, right? We already decide our truth. We already decide what we're going to do. And, and we're not willing to open our minds. Uh, last year when I, when I gave a message on... Uh, you know, cultural things, and we talked about the whole issue of, of uh, you know, gay rights and gay marriage and that type of thing. And what do you, what do you believe about that? Well, in my studies, I, I went online and, and I looked at all types of things. I read articles from, you know, the, I went to the gay Christian websites to, you know, the far end of everything and examined what people had to say. Because I wanted to be informed. I didn't want it just to be my opinion about what what people are saying. And I looked at compared to what they were saying to what the Word has to say before I presented a message. And that was an example where you tried to see all the, all the angles, what people are really saying, but then you come back to what does the Word of God say about those issues. And that was the basis of that message. Um, sometimes we don't read the Bible very carefully. There's a Burger King now has a menu. It's a picture menu. Okay? And if you you can ask for a picture menu. And so there was this one guy who was in the, in the Burger King restaurant and he saw all the signs saying ask, you know, you have a picture menu. So he just had to he said, "Okay, I just have to see this." So he asked for one. The guy gave him a picture menu. There's no words in it. There's just pictures. You can point to what you want. And so he asked the guy at the counter. He said, "Why do you have a picture menu?" He said, well, we do have people that come in here that, that can't read, so we give them a picture menu. So he thought a moment, and he said, how do they know you have a picture menu? <laughs> he says, it says it right there on the sign. <laughs> I 
Well, you know, you say, what do you want? What is God's will for my life? I don't know. God says it, says it here. <laughs> God tells us what He wants for our life very clearly and very plainly. Maybe not every single detail. You know, well, what's my, a lot of you, all you students are thinking about, when I graduate, what am I going to do? Where am I going to go? Well, if your life is guided by the principles here, it'll work out. Sooner or later, it'll work out. God gives us that direction. Truth. How, where do we look for truth? Do we allow our opinions to be challenged? Can we take off our theological glasses when we turn to the Word of God and say, what does it really say? See, it's only then that we truly can understand and comprehend what God has for us. But not only did the people formulate their own opinions, um, you know, they had, they, had, they had set their priorities wrong. They had their priorities set on their things. That's what verse 3 tells us. They set their priorities on fixing their houses. You know, we really need to have a nice house. I'm sure God wants us to have a nice house. And in fact, I'm sure God wants us to have a paneled house. And so we're going to get, you know, we're going to get all this in order because I'm sure God wants us to be happy. I'm sure God wants us to have all these nice things. Now, I have a house. It's not paneled, but it's sheetrock and it's painted and we got carpet and we got all that nice stuff in there. Okay, so I just want you to know that. But what is our priority in life? See, God's priority for the people was to build His temple and to bring and to worship Him correctly the way He had asked them to do. And they were going, you know, it, it doesn't really matter. Uh, we got we to get our stuff fixed first. They had set their priorities above God's priority. So what are your priorities? What are your priorities in life? Can you name them? You have priorities. Every one of us have priorities. Uh, if you have a job and you get up and go to work, your job is your priority, or one of them. Some of them, your family. Your families are priorities. Some of you are like me. you got grandkids. Those grandkids, are, they're a priority, right? That's why they call them grand. Okay? Um, you have priorities. Um, what are your priorities? How do they align with God's priorities? That's the question we need to ask ourselves. How do they align with God's priorities? Let me ask you this. How do you spend your free time? How do you spend your free time? How much of it is spent on self versus how much is spent on doing something for the kingdom of God? I'm not saying you have to use all your free time for that. Sure, you can have fun. You can go do, you know, have fun things. But how do you spend your time? It's an indication of some of your priorities. Our priorities are clearly listed for us in the Word. Jesus gave them very clearly. Go and make disciples of all nations. We're going to see when we get into the book of Acts, the priorities of the church of Jesus Christ. That's where we're going next. As we look to rebuild this church, we look to see what is the foundation of the church of Jesus Christ. We'll be looking in that next. As a 12-year-old girl who signed up to run uh, a 5K in, in New York. Her name was Leandra Rodriguez Esponda. She was a little late, so she ran up to the, up to the thing, and she, she got her, her number and got, it in ready, got ready in the race, and she took off running. And later, when the race was pretty much over, her mother couldn't find her. She didn't know where she was. The problem was she got in the line for the running of the half marathon rather than the 5K. 5K is three miles. A half marathon is 13.1 miles. 
She ran the entire race, finished it, and wound up with a trophy. Now, out of 2,111 finishers, she was 1,885th, but she was top among her age group. <laughs> How did she do that? She set her focus on the finish line and just kept putting one foot in front of the other. It's what are your priorities in life? What are you focusing on? Self or the kingdom of God? The last thing these people did quickly um, is one of the things they had out of order. If you remember down in, in chapter 2, where the word of the Lord comes to Haggai and he challenges them about what is holy and what is consecrated, or what is defiled. What is consecrated or what is defiled. And he, he asked this question in verse 13. Haggai said, if a person uh, defiled by contact with a dead body touches one of these things, does it become defiled? Yes, the priest replied. It becomes defiled. Then Haggai said, So it is with this people and the nation in my sight, declares the Lord. Whatever they do and whatever they offer, there is defiled. You see, remember we said God had a way that He wanted the people to worship Him. And that was in the temple. You build my temple, you bring your sacrifices, and you worship me. This is this was God's way of doing it. And they were saying, basically, it doesn't really matter. We can still bring our sacrifices. It doesn't matter if God's temple isn't there. And God says, oh, really? All your sacrifices are defiled because you're not following my way. Basically, what the deal was is they weren't taking their sin seriously. See, their sin of procrastination, their sin of you know, putting their opinions and their priorities before God and, and deciding how they were going to worship God rather than how He had said worship. They, they, they were not taking their sin seriously. A Louisiana man was charged, uh, was given a sentence of 20 years in prison, 20 years to life in prison for stealing $31 worth of candy. Sounds pretty severe. But evidently, in Louisiana... There's a law that, that upgrades a misdemeanor to a felony for repeated convictions. So he had repeatedly been caught and convicted of stealing candy and small things from stores. And so finally, he had done enough of them that a 31, you know, stealing $31 worth of Snickers bars landed him a 20-year sentence. This is kind of the way sin works. It's, it's progressive. It continues to build upon itself. Sometimes we sin and it doesn't seem so bad and it doesn't seem so bad and it doesn't seem so bad. But eventually, sin takes us down this path of destruction or corruption. That's the way sin works. It doesn't seem so bad sometimes at first. God is just saying here, take your sin seriously. Jesus said, Jesus said I took your sin seriously. He said, I took it to the cross. I took it seriously. Because that's what separates you between you and God. And Jesus said, I paid the price. I paid the penalty. You are redeemed. You don't have to pay for your sins. All is forgiven. But yet as followers of Christ, we do still commit sin. And, and, and the Scriptures are saying here, you know, look at, look at your sin. Deal with it correctly. Uh, last week, we celebrated communion. We don't do that every week. Communion is a time where we focus on, on our lives and what sin is doing. And we come to bring ourselves in confession before God. Um, be honest about your sins. It's easy to rename them. It's easy to cover them up. It's easy to, you know... Say, well, it's really not that bad. But God is saying, look, if you really want to do my work, if you want to be a part of building my kingdom, if you want to be effective in the kingdom of God, you've you got to look at, at sin in your life and deal with it. Don't just cover it up. William Campbell and Satosa Amora received 
the Nobel Prize, Prizes for Physiology and Medicine for their discovery in the 1970s of a special class of drugs that, that treated certain tropical diseases. These diseases were caused by certain parasites. But it comes to find out that their, their medicine that they came up with only treated the symptoms. People continue to suffer from these diseases because it doesn't deal with the parasites. You see, and that's what we often do with sin. We treat the symptoms, or we cover the symptoms. We don't deal with the real issue in our lives. What God is saying here in this passage is, look, Jesus, Messiah, has the right to rule. And are you resisting His right to rule? If you are, make some changes in your life. Focus on something other than yourself. One of my favorite stories in, in the Olympics was Simone Manuel. And we watched her in her first, uh, win her first gold medal. If, if you saw that race, how many of you saw that? You know, and she finished and touched the wall and turned around to look and she saw where she had placed and there was this, this surprised and just, you know, euphoric look on her face that she had won the gold medal. It was it was. It's a great moment in, in Olympic history. She became the first African-American woman to win a medal in swimming. And so it was a pretty significant event. She went on to win two golds and two silver in the Olympics. But what was really cool was her interview afterwards. Don't you love to hear the interview of first-time Olympians, first-time uh, gold medalist? I mean, she was so excited about the fact that, that she won this medal, but she kept saying, it is such an honor to represent the United States. And it's such an honor to be a part of this team. She said, whether I ever won a medal or not, it's such an honor to be a part of these other athletes that are here in this, this, in this, you know, this, this uh, Olympics. And, you know, there was this, this whole realm of, of, you know, focusing on other things and other people rather than herself. It's, it's a beautiful picture of humility. And I think this is what what we have to look at in our own lives. Um, it's not about us. It's about the one we represent. And it's not about just me. It's about my team, right? That's what the church is. It's a team. So when we surrender our lives to Christ and we work together as a team, we build His kingdom on the earth. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this time in your word. And um, Lord, we admit that at times we do resist your right to rule in our lives. We go our own ways. We do our own things. We find ourselves you know, maybe in a place we don't, we don't want to be. We humbly humble ourselves before you and say, Jesus, you are Lord. You are God. You have the right to rule every area of our lives. And we pray that you would open our eyes to see those things that we have, when we have turned away, when we've placed our opinions or our priorities before you, whenever we've not really taken sin in our lives seriously, we surrender that before you and, and we just exalt and glorify your name now. And we pray in your precious and holy name. Amen.